in five, four, three, two. Hi now. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Hello, Cinephiles, and welcome to Silver Screen Sips, a podcast where two idiots talk about movies. And today we're discussing the film Hi, Carly. Temple. <laughs> yeah, that is a cinematic masterpiece. Um, I go to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today we're talking about Temple of Doom, in case any of you were wondering. <laughs> I go to India. <laughs> just a reminder that there are spoilers ahead for movies and TV shows that you may not have seen yet. So just know. You've been warned. Uh, huh? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. how's it going? It's going. I have a headache. <laughs> oh no! So, let's kick it off with this week in Hollywood. Adam Sandler is set to receive the People's Icon Award at the People's Choice Awards this year for his decades-long career in comedy and memorable characters that have left a mark on audiences. Yeah, because who could forget Hubie from Hubie's Halloween, as well as his comedic success. Sandler has also impressed. With his dramatic roles, touche, often mm-hmm. receiving critical acclaim and being considered for prestigious awards. 2024's People's Choice Awards is due to air on Sunday, February 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on NBC, Peacock, and E. Sorry, sorry. E! There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. The new film, The Beekeeper, and the new Mean Girls musical have been duking it out for the top spot in the box office this week. And shockingly, the beekeeper has come out on top. I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Oh, the film actually beat Mean Girls three of the four weekdays this past stretch and continued on through with 7.4 million to narrowly take the weekend. Oh. Its total now stands at 42.2 million um, domestic box office as of today. Interesting. I, I, the only reason that this came as a shock to me is because I feel like I've seen Mean Girls all over social media, but I have not heard anything about the Beekeeper other than your post. Oh, yeah. It's an okay movie. I don't it's... even know what it's about. Is it about a guy who takes care of bees? You're No, you're not wrong. <laughs> really? Well, the guy takes care of bees, but he also is like a John Wick style person. Um, and then okay. he's like, is someone he is someone he uh, who took care of him kind of like uh dies to his like fishing scams and so he goes on like a murderous rampage interesting okay so instead of instead of the dog dying it's his like mother figure ah <laughs> mm, another loved one and also a lot of bee puns <laughs> i love it yeah jason statham talking about bees is is not what i expected in my bingo card this year but here we are oh, jeez and another actor to receive an honorable award, Keanu Reeves. Oh, John Wick. Here you go. Is honored to be with the inaugural Lance Riddick Legacy Award. Wait, is to be honored with the inaugural Lance Riddick? I'm sorry. Is Lance Riddick the, like he's receiving the it's award? The, or he, No, it's the name of the award. The award is called the Lance Riddick Legacy Award. Yes. Okay. That is very confusing. Um, it is. Okay, so Keanu Reeves is being honored with the inaugural Lance Reddick Legacy Award at the Saturn Awards. God, okay. Which (laughs) are February 4th yesterday. Yesterday, since this episode comes out on the 5th, Academy President Robert, I swear to you, that says hooligan. I'm just saying, but it's it's like Hall Gwynn. Yeah, Hall Gwynn, I guess. Hall Gwynn. Hall Gwynn. And and Saturn producers Bradley and Kevin Marcus explain why Reeves was chosen for the honor, saying, quote, this award symbolizes and celebrates not only a performer's talents, but their character someone who's a true goodwill ambassador in the industry which that is Keanu Reeves yeah say say what you will about Keanu Reeves acting or what he does <laughs> yeah that man is golden hearted <laughs> mm-hmm. yes Keanu Reeves definitely deserves the Oscar the Oscar the Oscar so sorry the inaugural Lance Reddick Legacy Award at the Saturn Awards such a mouthful so <laughs> Millie Alcock right uh-huh has landed the role of Supergirl for James Gunn's takeover of the DCU. Not the MCU, the DCU. The the reboot. (laughs) Yeah. Take two. A bigger question now might be where we'll see her first. Rumor has it that Alcock's character will debut in Superman Legacy before she leads her own film, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. But nobody quite knows as of right now. Um, Superman Legacy is scheduled for release on July 11th of 2025, and I believe James Gunn is directing that and 
they're starting production soon. So we'll see. I hope they take their time because if they copy MCU right now, God help them. <laughs> I mean, James Gunn did do Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and that was like the only one, the, the only like decent Marvel film to come out since the new ones, like the new phase. I mean, like as a as a as a cinematic universe, because like yeah, you see, I'm not I'm not going to watch 16 different TV shows just to catch up on four different movies right. to watch three different characters I don't care about, to then watch five characters I didn't know existed die. Like I, didn't, like, I don't get it. That's what I like about this one. I feel like if you just watch the other Guardians of the Galaxies, you can still follow it, and like they mention little tiny things, but to the overall story arc i don't think it's that important that's what i like to hear yes <laughs> anyways anyways next on our list a sequel to the iconic zombie film 28 days later lands at sony danny boyle and alex garland are behind a long-awaited sequel which is titled 28 years later and could launch a trilogy of zombie films and may return Killian murphy to his breakout role as of right now boyle and garland are writing and directing the sequel which also comes with a part two interesting to be written by garland boyle would only direct the first project with the sequel's director being determined at a later stage. Killian is also returning as an executive producer, which crazy, man. It's crazy how that movie made on like a shoestring budget. And yeah. they only had like, I think they spent they spent a big chunk of that budget on just the scene of him walking around like the, the middle of London. And they did it like in the middle of the day and they only had like 15 minutes to <laughs> shut down all, all of the like the main downtown. They just, they filmed it real quickly. And they're like, we got this, we gotta go. <laughs> It's truly a feat. Yeah, so I don't know. I've, I've think about. I've only ever seen the first one. I know there's 28 weeks later. They were gonna name up. this one 28 months later, but then it was too long of a a time since the first one, so they decided to name it 28 years. Yeah, I do wonder because like the rage virus, it didn't make them into typical zombies. Like they mm -hmm. were zombies, but like it, they weren't like dead people zombies. It was just a virus that enraged them to the point where they like they didn't care if they hurt themselves while they're like just going after in blind rage yeah so interesting i kind of hope wonder what's gonna happen i'm also curious i also need to see the first one season new season <laughs> oh perhaps perhaps oh. speaking of seasons there could be a new series on the horizon um with this new headline are you ready for this oh god no so peter pan is now in the public domain. Great. You know what that means. We're getting an MCU style cinematic universe with Peter Pan, Winnie the Pooh, and, and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yep. So uh, director- oh, That's not a joke? <laughs> oh, hear me out. Okay. So director Scott Jeffrey, who is the man behind Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Okay. Okay, we all know that one. Is now venturing to another childhood classic destination. Neverland. The upcoming horror film, Peter Pan's Neverland Nightmare. Oh boy. Will be incredibly tense and dark. Uh, following Wendy's search for her abducted brother. Tinkerbell. Here, this, this line is crazy. Tinkerbell okay. in this version is depicted as hooked on heroin. Believing, <laughs> believing it's pixie dust. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, so Jeffrey's team plans to expand their horror universe with upcoming films like Pinocchio Unstrung and Bambi The Reckoning. Bambi? <laughs> so is it like a see... zombie deer? What is this? I have no idea, but you can see the first look. Oh of my Peter Pan God, online. Bambi? Bambi becomes like a John Wick style person because- Oh, because they killed her mom or his mom. His, his mom, mom and then- he... Yeah. Is it? Yeah. I think it's that Bambi's a boy. Bambi is a boy. Okay. Fuck yeah. So, Bambi goes on a murderous rampage after they kill his mother. He gathers up, he gathers up a ragtag team of people to go after an evil queen. Yeah. Because, is or it, evil is king. It, no, the hunter is the bad guy in that movie, isn't it? In Bambi? I've never seen Bambi, to be honest with you. I haven't seen Bambi since I was a kid. It's one of the ones that I never really cared for growing up, just because it's sad. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't cry. When Same with Pinocchio. Know. I also don't think I've ever watched. I mean, probably as a kid I did, but I have no recollection of the actual Pinocchio animated movie. I saw the new one with, that Guillermo del Toro did, and it was way better. <laughs> um, but either way, you can see pictures online if, of 
the creepy Peter Pan. Um, it's like, I guess their concept right now for him. It's kind of funny in my opinion. I can't, I mean like the concept of of Peter Pan, right? It's, it's like, creepy. He goes around kidnapping kids to an island where they never grow up yeah. and they can never leave. <laughs> yeah, it is It is kind of already a horror -y type vibe. Um, I'm actually going to drop of the photo in our Discord, so if anyone actually wants to see that, they can go to our Discord channel and join that. Where should I put it? In meet show notes? Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be in our show notes channel. Um, you'll just see a creepy, haggard looking thing. But yeah, uh, a Disney <laughs> horror <laughs> universe, I think, yes, it could be a potential season on the horizon. Um, That's wild. That will be so fun. But anyways, that concludes this week in Hollywood. You can find all of our sources cited on our Discord channel, along with our show notes. So you can go see Creepy Peter Pan. You know what I you know what I need? And it's not heroin, apparently. Oh, I need some alcohol. Oh, yeah. Now it's time for Big Lou's Big Bruise. Now, unfortunately, he is not here to give it to us in person. What mm, a shame. Rest in peace. Rest in peace, Big Lou. What? Let me pull this up. We can talk about all the stuff that he's given us from the Beyond the Grave. Whoop, whoop. Before his heart was ripped out in front of us. No, I was kidding. <laughs> um, God damn. <laughs> today we have the, is it, it's called the Temple of Doom. Really Woo. no one knows. Yeah. Uh, this cocktail is created by, uh, it's credit, at Cocktail and Code, Dominic Kendall on Instagram. Featured, and this was featured on Scrappy's Bitters. The Temple of Doom. Now, let's get into what this drink is, shall we? Or like, you know, how to make it. So, yes, here's what I need. Right. Half an ounce of Diplom Diplomatico Reservoir Rum. Five ounces of, I think he meant rum when he typed this. Rum Jam Arg Argoil Blanc. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's French. Half an ounce of Cointreau. Half an ounce of Velvet Berlinum. Half an ounce of Amaro. Falernum? Huh? What? Fern I think Falernum? it's Falernum. For, what did I say? Fernum? You said Falernum. Falernum? It was just different, like, uh, emphasis on the syllables. He really needs to give me a phonetic. Like, when he makes these, he needs to give us yeah, phonetics. Yeah, we should text him and say, you need to give us phonetics here. We're stupid. Uh, and you're gonna we were homeschooled. Yeah, we were. Half an ounce of Amaro Montenegro. Three dashes mm. of Scrappy's Lime Bitters. Nice. Two spritzes of a mint-infused green sartreuse. Okay. All right, now here's how we make it. There's a lot going on here. Uh, mm -hmm. Add all the ingredients to a shaker with ice. Stir. Strain into rocks glass with ice. Spritz with mints infused green cartouche. Enjoy. Oh. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of ingredients, but it, overall, it's easy steps. Yeah. Okay. Not bad. Okay. Not bad. Now, I don't know what half these drinks are, <laughs> but... Well, rum, first off. Yeah, rum. But what is velvet? Triple sec. Rum. Bitters. I don't know what... What is Agricole Blanc, Blanc is? Oh, it's another type of rum. Okay. So you get two types oh. of rum. Velvet Ferlinum is also a rum. It's a liqueur. Okay. This is a lot so of rum. Another liqueur. <laughs> Amaro, Montenegro. It's a rum-based rum. liqueur. Okay. Okay. So it's a lot of rums. Four out of five. Automatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, this sounds right up your alley. Um, I'm I'm not a, a big hater on rum. I do like, I, I, I do not mind rum. Um. I would think I would give it a three and a half, though, um, just because it's not my go to cup of rum. Eh? Boo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very, very rum forward, you know, that would account for all the rum. Yes. Yes. There's four different types of rum in this drink. Mm -hmm. um, it's only equivalent to about two shots of rum, though. So. That's not that much, I guess. Um, yeah, I'll give it. I'll give it a four. Fuck it. I'm giving it a four. I'm being open minded. Yeah, she's being open minded, guys. It's very rare. Yeah, <laughs> very rare. <laughs> well, thank you, Lewis, for the fantastic dream with the very creative name. Might I? Add. Am I gonna? Am I gonna feel it in my heart? Ha! I see what you did there. Uh, it took me a minute. I'm not gonna lie. I was like, "What? I don't get it." But I got it, and I like it. <sighs> All right. Well, is it gonna give me heartburn? That's the real question. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Yes. Yeah, it's gonna burn my throat. That's for sure. Dude, I had to take tums before I had spaghetti tonight. That's how fucking old I am. 
<laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it's bad. Um. Bad. Anyways, we'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Tums. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Please, though, could you sponsor us? I would love that. I, I take Tums uh, every day. I need a lifetime um, supplies. <laughs> I really do. Um, no, our sponsor today is Shaker and Spoon. The exact reason I have heartburn. <laughs> it is a monthly subscription service that gives you bar quality recipes and ingredients designed by award-winning mixologists. Their latest box, Totally Tequila. Features incredible tequila blanco cocktail recipes. If you'd like your very own box to drink along with us, uh, then you can head over to shakerandspoon.com and use our promo code SIPS10 to get $10 off your first subscription. Again, that is promo code SIPS10, S-I-P-S-10, to get $10 off. Thank you, Shaker and Spoon, for being a fantastic sponsor. Uh, so I have a question for best question of the day. Uh-huh. That was that was good. Uh, okay, this question was a, only a matter of time before I asked it. Yes, my heart has been ripped out of my chest. I know yes. what it feels to have my heart broken. <sighs> Do you want me to make you a drink? <laughs> I already got one. It's a lot of rum. <laughs> nice. Okay, so my question is this: mm-hmm. Indiana Jones, right? He's got a couple iconic things about him: the hat, right? Yeah. The the outfit. Yeah. But most importantly, the leather, the whip. The whip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, the whip, the whip. Now, the whip. my question for you is, mm-hmm. if you were a suave Tomb Raider, what would your iconic weapon be? The sword of Damocles. <laughs> the what? I'm sorry. The sword of Damocles. The fuck is that? Uh, I don't know how you spell Damocles. Um. Sword of Damocles was the name of an early virtual reality head-mounted display tracking system. (laughs) It was a joke. I thought it was an actual sword. Um, You thought it was an actual sword? The Sword of Damocles sounds like an actual sword. What can I say? Um, It does. Is it Sword of Damocles? There's no way. It's got to be an actual sword. It's it's, no. It's If you say that someone has a Sword of Damocles hanging over their head, you mean that they are in a situation in which something very bad could happen to them. It's a phrase. Can my, can the item I have with me be a concept? (laughs) Only you would have a fucking concept. Uh, Yeah, I know, right? Uh, (laughs) Hmm. Now let me think about it. It would definitely be a gun of some sort. I think. Oh, that's lame. Pick something. Lame. Well, like, that's not like iconic. Everyone has a gun. No one has, no one carries a whip. Like if someone came to me and had a whip, I would first off be a little turned on. Second (laughs) off. (laughs) Um, hmm, hmm. the second off, I'd be scared is what I was going to say. I'm trying to think like of items, right? Yeah. Like, cause there's whips. There's a pitchfork, which is stupid. I'm not the devil. Uh, <laughs> or a fucking mob. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's not an ogre in the vicinity. <laughs> no one's crying wolf. Just, uh, let me look up a list of weapons real quick. Um, I'm sure it can, uh, you know what? It would be Gogo. Yut- oh my God. What's your name? Gogo Yutabi. That was- I don't know what that uh, is. You know, go, go, sorry, it would be Gogo Yabari's weapon from Kill Bill. Which one's that? She is the one with, uh, she's the assassin with the, the, the oh, chain. Oh, yeah. The scythe and the ball on the end with the I saw with a the picture razors. of that when I, yeah, I saw a picture of that when I looked up unique weapons. What is her, what is her The schoolgirl? It is a chain Kill mace. Bill? It is a chain mace, but she's fucking, yeah, that's cool. It would be something like, like that, but it would, I wouldn't do the ball part. It would be just too, they would do. It would be two sword like items. Like scorpion, scorpion, basically. Get over here. Doesn't From those Mortal Kombat? Ah, uh, yeah. Kind of like that. Same similar concept. Similar concept, except the blade does not come out of my hand. <laughs> mm, okay. Fair enough. Ooh, I got mine. Okay, what is yours? Revive me, I got a ray gun. Revive me, I have Olympia. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would be a ray gun. I feel like that would be fucking terrifying. Specifically, the the Black Ops ray gun. <laughs> the Black Ops 2 ray gun, yes. Or like, um, oh, hold on. This is going to be super... Nerdy? No. I thought it was Outlast 2. Um, I'm mistaken. I think a scythe would be kind of cool, though. A, like a, are you thinking of the, the axe thing that is on the cover of 
Outlast yeah, 2? Yeah, but I think like an actual scythe would be cool. Like a Grim Reaper type thing, you know? We've gone from, I don't know who adventures around with a scythe, but. <laughs> uh, someone to be fucking terrified of, that's who. Just saying. <laughs> you, just, you could literally just hold that on your, like over your shoulder and just walk around with that thing. And it could be used, it actually, it serves multiple purposes because a ray gun it only has one purpose, to kill. But a scythe I could use as like a climbing, like a pickaxe, climbing axe, like literal Tomb Raider and just climb up walls and shit with it. You are having so much fun with this. I really am. What was your answer again? It was oh, a, right, um, the, the, oh, that's still like usable though because they're on a chain so you could attach, you could throw one blade into like a wall or something and then swing across gaps with the other end you know what i'm saying yeah wow these are amazing choices it, i just found gogo yabari's weapon is called a meteor hammer Me- i'm sorry a meteor a meteor hammer <laughs> okay interesting that's a badass name that's a badass name a meteor hammer consists of a sphere metal plastic or rubber attached to either a rope or a chain. But yeah, no, I wouldn't go with the, the sphere. I would have two. Uh, it's a sword. It's a Japanese samurai sword, but like the smaller one that's usually meant for disembowelment. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the speechless, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> and just like that, we have lost our sponsor. Tonto. My bad. That's Tonto. <laughs> tonto? A T- yeah, TNT. Oh, it's a Tonto. I see, it's, I see. It's a smaller, yeah, like yeah, a smaller yeah. samurai sword. Beautiful. Well, you heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it here first. Isaiah wants to disembowel people. <laughs> and I want to have whips and chains. And a ray gun! <laughs> Babe, I'm bringing the ray gun to bed. <laughs> Whoa. Fuck yeah. Um... Anyways, yeah, thank you for answering my question. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You you can take it from here, right? I can leave. You got the rest of it. Yeah, it's my opinion only now. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, let me tell you about some things now. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just leave again. <laughs> okay, okay. For real. I'm here. Let's go. Let's okay. do this. Let's do this. Now it's time for some facts from me, your local fact person. Alcoholic. Mm. Yes. Yes. Lose an enabler. What do we got? We have uh, George Lucas being weird again, but we'll get to that. Uh, <clears throat> now, Spielberg later recalled that when Lucas first approached him for doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, George said, if I directed the first one, I would have to direct a trilogy. He had three stories in mind, and it turned out George did not have three stories in mind, and they basically had to make subsequent stories up as they went along. Both men later attributed the film's tone as much darker than Raiders due to the personal moods following both of their relationships having divorces at the time. Spielberg and George Lucas are like the best or like best friends. They are the buddy cop duo. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. Lucas wrote a film treatment that included a haunted castle in Scotland, but Spielberg felt it was too similar to Poltergeist. So they changed it to a temple in India. Okay. Uh, Yeah. I think. Well, okay. We'll get, we'll get to that. I'm curious about what a haunted castle in Scotland would have been for this movie. I just feel like they're Irish ghosts. I feel like vampire. Yeah, it's like vampires and shit. Now, just like the last movie, the character of Willie was named after Spielberg's cocker spaniel. Oh my god, Lucas Spielberg, um, Katz and Hyuk, which uh, those are the last names of two of the uh, writers, I believe, were concerned okay. about how to keep the audience audience's interest while explaining the thuggy cult. Mm. Joking Cats proposed a tiger hunt, but Spielberg said, there's no way I'm going to stay in India long enough to shoot a tiger hunt. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been having flashbacks from Egypt. Um, <laughs> they eventually decided on a dinner scene involving eating bugs, monkey brains, and the like. Steven jo- and Steve and George both still react like children, so their idea was to make it as gross as possible, says mm-hmm. Cats. Which, yeah, that's... They did a good up. job. Yeah, that, yeah. Now, the opening is a reference to James Bond as Spielberg wanted, still wanted to make that 007 movie <laughs> before oh, Lucas yeah. convinced him to do this. That. Yeah, it's very James Bond-esque with the mm-hmm. white suit. The white and suit, the martini. Yeah. Now, uh, 
this scene is actually taken from a deleted scene that was going to be made for Temple of Doom, but they had to cut it out mm. of, the, of their script. So they decided they want to do it here instead to make it an opening. Okay. Also, the opening of it being a musical was George Lucas's idea. Oh, God. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. Um, Harrison Ford, later on in the movie, herniated his back when flipping a stuntman over his back. But the man is a legend. He said, no, we're going to keep on shooting. And in between, they brought in a hospital bed. And in between takes, they, he would just lie on it. And then he would go oh back to work. And then he'd go back and lie on it. Eventually, uh, Lucas and Spielberg were like, bro, this is, <laughs> you got to go. You got to go. What like did this. he do? He herniated it? Yes. So like. Yeah. Herniated disc. Yeah. Yeah. That's extremely herniated painful. Disc. And he's just hanging out. He's like, I got this. He'll act. Then go back to bed. <laughs> wow. So they stopped production for like five weeks and they sent and they flew Harrison Ford back to L.A. for an experimental back surgery. Experimental. He, sur- he was fine and he recovered fairly quickly. And he claims Harrison Ford himself claims that the reason he recovered so quickly is because of the regiment that he went into to get into the correct physique for the for Indiana Jones for mm-hmm. his scenes. Yeah, that, <laughs> that could be a pretty big factor. Now, nearly 50,000 bugs were used for the Temple of Doom. Ugh. Most of them escaped onto the streets of London. <laughs> oh, my God. No yeah, so, way. Uh, I think it was like 85% of the bugs just gone. They're, they're out there. Jesus. Now, to film a scene where Cape Capshaw dealt with the bugs, she had to be medically sedated since she freaked out so much. Really? Yeah. So I think there's, a, I think there's like a shot of where Indiana Jones picks her up and runs her out of one of the bug rooms. Because she's freaking out so hard. Yeah, I think she's like fully sedated. (laughs) Wow. Which. So she wasn't even acting at that point, I guess. Yeah, no, she, that woman probably, that was probably not acting. She was probably terrified. (laughs) Jeez. As mentioned before, the head exploding scene that almost got an R rating for the first movie. Yeah. The heart ripping scene almost got Temple of Doom, the R rating. Whoa, no way. Really? Yeah. Yes. And so uh, they got away with it. They got somehow, nobody knows how, but they got away with a PG rating for this. But it raised concerns. Yeah, that's being insane. Like, they were like, okay, well, we got the, the, it's not rated R because not everything in here is rated R, but like that is concerning. So Spielberg then proposed to the then president of the MPAA, Motion Picture Association of America. They're the guys who do the ratings. A PG-13 rating for movies that fall in between PG and R. Yes, I did find out about this literally right before we started recording that. Continue. Yeah, so Spielberg is to thank for a PG-13 rating. And also Indiana Jones. So thank for that. That's insane. That's kind of cool. It's funny that like, the, so technically Temple of Doom and Raiders of Lock Art, Lost Ark are still PG. They never really updated them to PG-13. They're technically still PG. Hmm. But all subsequent movies after that are PG-13. But there is, they wanted to originally make the movie in, they were going to film it in an actual temple. However, the Indian government said, we want to copy the script before we agree to it. So they mm-hmm. sent us them. They didn't think it was going to be an issue. And then the Indian government said, yeah, no, you can't do it in that temple. And you can't mention the Thucky cult or these other things. Mm. And they're like, uh, but we, that's kind of the plot of the movie. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we're not going to agree to that. We also want final, final cut rights. And they were like, no, there's no way we're giving an Indian government final cut rights <laughs> to, to the movie. Yeah, that's crazy. So uh, they ended up doing it in Sri Lanka instead mm. and then doing smaller uh, map paintings to fill out the outer parts of the, of the temple. Mm, but yeah, okay. other, than, other than the main temple areas, everything else is a soundstage. Wow. And that's all of our fact today. But I did have a little side note from Spielberg, which I do think... The man gave you this himself? Yes. He called the me on the phone. <laughs> the way you worded it, you're like, I do have a side note here from Spielberg. <laughs> like, like Spielberg, he fucking yes. wrote you a note. <laughs> Spielberg wrote me a note. I found it in my diaries. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> he did, he, so he makes a special note that I, th- I thought was saying of the industry, even though he came out and said this like, what, 30 years ago? <laughs> 30 or 40 mm-hmm. years ago? In the 80s? And it just kind of resonates, especially given the fact that today we have to deal with all these sequels and things like that. But he said, the danger in making a sequel is that you can never satisfy everyone. You give people the same movie with different scenes. They say why weren't you more original but if you give them the same character in another fantastic adventure but with different tone you risk disappointing the other half of the audience 
You just wanted a carbon copy of the first film with a different girl and a different bad guy. So mm-hmm. you, win, you win and you lose both ways. And I think that's just a very concise way to explain how we see the industry nowadays and how the executives of all these studios and stuff like that see the see these so they try to win both sides seeing who which how they can get it the most yeah you see that especially i think with star wars yeah and that's how you end up with the sequel the all the sequels that are terrible and stuff like that because they're trying to they're trying to hit too many check boxes if they want the Mm -hmm. same they want a new adventure but we want them to try the same places we give them different stories but they're technically the same stories they're just yeah in a different spot exactly so i think that's just an interesting note that he said Especially given that even though this movie, it's actually a prequel, if nobody noticed. Yeah, I didn't know that until also right before recording. Yeah, so this one takes place in 1935, but the second movie takes place in 1940. Is there anyone who's not around for the rest of them? I don't think so. Damn, he's like the best part of the movie. So I think the fact that like, you know, that the sequel is so different in tone, but it's still... You know, like it's it's still hailed as like a great movie. It's kind of crazy given the fact that in today's landscape we have so many sequels and they're all ass. <laughs> like mostly they're yeah. like ni- like ninety percent of the time is not going to be a good movie. Yeah, fair enough. But those are all our facts today. Oh, very good. Still had a, a decent amount, like last episode. All right. Well, uh, let's dive into the movie now, shall we? We shall. Would you like to go first? Yeah, I'm on a roll. Why not? Yeah. Much like the last one, I don't have much to say. Mm -hmm. So I gave this movie a four out of five. I think it's pretty much on par with the original. If the first movie didn't exist and then they made this movie instead and they had like the first movie's introduction and then they just went with the rest of this movie, I think it would have been just as good as a first movie for Indiana Jones. So that's why I gave it a four out of five because it's another adventure. It's very episodic. Yeah. Rather than like, oh, this is a continuation of the last one. Right. Or, you know, since it's a prequel, it's like prequel, leading yeah. up. Yeah, it's leading up to the second one, like, or the first one. It, like, it doesn't, they feel very contained on their own. A few notes. I think the fact that Willie is a white woman doing a Chinese musical intro is a bit problematic. That's kind of weird. <laughs> it felt tone deaf, but like at the time, it wouldn't have been tone deaf. It just would have been like normal. Anyway, also, I saw Kathleen Kennedy produce this movie. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh. God. <laughs> right. I forgot she's in this. Yes. A little bit. Now, I think Willie is just an insufferable character. I oh, my God. I'm so, so glad much. you said it. <laughs> oh, I was really like on the edge of my seat waiting for you to say it because I was like, please don't tell me you like her. Please don't tell yeah, me. No, she's... Was, Dude, I couldn't stand her. I couldn't stand her more than the last one. Yeah, she was like Marion minus all the good parts of Marion. <laughs> yeah, at least Marion was like somewhat useful. This girl is so utterly annoying. Like Marion, she would be like Indy, but at least she could hold her own at some point. Yeah. Where this one, it was just Indy, and it was just Indy, 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 like a whole way. Like it wasn't there was even no Indy. It was just screaming. I was like, "Girl, shut up!" Even Indiana Jones was like, "Shut the fuck up." <laughs> But yeah, no, she's an insufferable character. I think she's no redeeming qualities because she is just greedy. Yeah. It's all about her. And then when it's not about her, it's about, oh, well, we have diamonds we can find. Oh, we have jewels. Oh, we have things that are going to be making rich. Like, it's just. Yeah, they're like, like about to die. And she's like, I don't want to. And they're like, save us from the fucking spikes in the ceiling. Yeah. Like, oh, though, Indy, who would you call it? Harrison Ford's delivery of the line, we, Willie, we are going to die, is probably the best line it's delivery so I've ever seen. Yeah. It's like, a, I felt it. I was like, Jenny was like, man, he's pissed off at this woman right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do got to give it to the art department. Making those sets, those sets are crazy. They, oh, yeah. The amount of time, detail they put in those things are, cr- my God. And then the special effects, I, I don't understand how they got worse. <laughs> yeah. Like, unbelievably, noticeably worse. Yeah, like especially towards the end when Indy's hanging off the side of the mountain when the water's rushing through the coal mines. It just, you could tell it was just so bad. <laughs> mm. I, I, def, I generally felt like if I was, if I was Steven Spielberg or George Lucas and I saw that, I'd be like, yeah, we're going to cut that shot out of the movie. <laughs> we don't need it. We know, he's, we know he's climbing the mountain. We know he's climbing the side of the mountain. We don't need the shot to show that. Yeah. 
especially since it looked so bad. But you know, yeah, it really looked very green screened. Yeah, very obviously green screened in an era where green screens didn't exist. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, four out of five, solid movie, solid adventure. Okay. Um. Well, I gave this a three and a half. Okay. Little less than than the first one. Um, for a few reasons, mainly because I couldn't stand Willie. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was a big part of it. Okay. So there's, there was a lot of things I did like, I loved short round. I thought his character is great. I mean, it's very, he's a very, it's a very iconic character. This was right before the Goonies. So it was, was kind of like his bigger like role. That's kind of like what set him off was this role. And then obviously he had the Goonies a year later. So, and then everywhere, everything all at once. Everything everywhere. Everything everywhere all at once. Um, those are like his three biggest ones. I could be blanking on others, but those are like the three that everyone knows him for. Short Round's great. I actually have never seen this movie. I thought I did as a kid, but I was watching it and like none of it. Like I didn't even know the heart ripping thing. The heart ripping scene. I the never. Most, the most famous scene of like all of Indiana Jones. <laughs> See, to me, the most famous scene is the face melting scene or like the big boulder rock in the beginning of the first movie um but yeah i was like watching it and jacob was also watching it he's like oh this is like a really iconic scene i was like it is he's like yeah you don't know it i was like no i don't he's like oh he's like keep watching (laughs) and then yeah then they they ripped the guy's heart i was like oh well then look at that wow didn't know that was gonna happen I really thought this. Yeah, you said it earlier. This movie definitely has a much darker, more disturbing and like serious tone than the first one. I mean, they still have jokes and stuff, but it's just like a much more serious theme. You know, there's like child slavery in it. There's human sacrifices and like the gore. It's like the heart ripping part is like it's a lot more dark and disturbing. (laughs) Um, They really were depressed. (laughs) They really went from like zero to 100 for sure. Uh, I think that minecart scene was a lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed that. It really made me think of like a ride at like Disney or Universal or something. Mm -hmm. The way that it was shot and stuff. And I was like, this definitely has to be a roller coaster. How is this not a roller coaster right now? Unless there is one. Uh, There's an Indiana Jones coaster ride at Disneyland Paris. Aha. Paris knows what's up. (laughs) My Frenchies. (laughs) Um, so my issues or my critiques on this film, I felt like the story to me, as even though it was like a little more dark and disturbing and stuff, I just, I don't know. It didn't feel as interesting somehow as the first one, um, did. I felt like this one, I just, it was not my cup. I mean, it's not that it wasn't my cup of tea. It actually was my cup of tea, but I just didn't want the tea at the moment. I think that like, okay, in the beginning, right? The James Bond-esque scene. Mm-hmm. The Asian guy, um, Indiana Jones helper, who gets shot in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Did you notice there was no bullet hole entry? He just starts bleeding underneath his shirt. I wrote that down because I was like, that doesn't make any sense. How is that possible? Or like them jumping out of an airplane in a raft. And somehow surviving that fall. How the fuck did that happen? How does that work? Twice. Twice. They fell from an airplane and then they fell off a cliff. How did they survive that twice with no injuries? I also wrote, why is every girl character so annoying? We talked about that. And this one just felt a little like as much as, yes, it was darker tones. And um, I, I still felt that it was a little bit cheesier and a little bit cringier at times with some of the lines, especially like the romance between Willie and Indiana Jones. It just felt really weird and quick. And I was like, ugh. and like some of this like stuff they would say to each other. I was like, ugh, so gross and so uncomfortable feeling. It was very sleazy, <laughs> very sleazy. So I gave it a three and a half. It, it wasn't bad. Don't get me wrong. I thoroughly enjoyed the film, but it definitely was not. I, I, I enjoyed the first one more. And the first one, I think I gave a four or four and a half. So Fair. Yeah, that, that is that is it. Interesting. Um, do you have anything else you would like to add? We have Dark Peter Pan and a darker Temple of uh, 
Temple of Jones is what to say. <laughs> Temple of Jones. We can't see. It's too dark. Anyways, thank you for listening to today's episode. Please feel free to send in any movie suggestions you'd like us to watch and review for our upcoming listeners' episodes. You can send those in at silverscreensips at gmail.com. And if you don't follow us already, then be sure to also follow us on Instagram so you can get any and all updates regarding the show. We will see you guys next week with The Last Crusade. Is that Sean Connery? No, this is Sean Connery. Okay. Thank you. That was that was cringier than the fucking movie. Jesus.